I'm Quaylen Nassar. So why did Christ walk the earth among us? Was he trying to tell us something? Was he trying to show us something? John Rigetti is going to be talking with Father Polycarp Romaeus. He's the pastor of the Dormition Orthodox Church in Oakmont. They're going to be talking about the Incarnation. Father Emmaus is also the head of the Spiritual Court of the Metropolis of Pittsburgh and also one of the hosts of The Voice of Orthodoxy on WEDO Radio. That's 810 on your AM dial, Sundays from 2 to 3.30. So, the Incarnation, just what does that mean? Father Polycarp, welcome. Thank you very much. It's nice to have you with us. It's very nice to be here with you, John. The Incarnation. This is a word that doesn't necessarily mean a lot to a lot of people in contemporary society. Let's start there. What does Incarnation mean? Well, if we take the word by itself, it comes from the Latin incarne, which means in the flesh. And it's derived also from the Greek ensarkosis, which uh, pertains to the birth of Jesus Christ. Now, this is a unique concept, a unique understanding, theological understanding. And I guess the best way to start a little bit to get a vision of what this means is to go to the Old Testament. And in the Old Testament, when God created the world, He created everything good. He created man in His image. He created all of nature, seeing everything seen and everything unseen. And it was all good. The unfortunate thing, not about God's creation, but nevertheless about man, well, it's fortunate, it's not really an unfortunate situation, but man was created with free will. And he, that is the image of God, because God has the free will to be totally good. The angels that were created by God had the free will to choose out of time what they wanted to be. And they chose goodness. And of course, according to the Bible, we hear the story of Lucifer and his fall, where they chose evil. But man also has this opportunity to choose. And in the Old Testament, we see, especially in the book of Genesis, in chapter 6, I believe, verse 3, God says a very unique thing to man. He said, my spirit will not abide with him because he is flesh. Now, the idea of the spirit not abiding with man at that time was because man chose a different route. He chose to be disobedient to God. And the disobedience was that he chose to look to himself as if he's the catalyst of his own creation. I can do anything I want. It's like a rebellious teenager, like a child that loves its parents, but doesn't really want to listen and go about and do whatever it wants. We turn free will into absolute control. That's right, well. yeah. And I think you as a parent and all the parents out there will understand that the Scripture, the Old Testament, and the New Testament can be very well understood in the basics of life, family life, relationships, um, nature, and all of these things, because even nature speaks to us of the incarnation of Christ. Uh, our family life speaks of the incarnation of Christ. And to understand this, uh, again, going back to the Old Testament, where the Lord said, I cannot ab my spirit will not abide in them. Yet in the New Testament, this is all turned around. And Jesus said, I will be with you even unto the end of the age. And this he says to his disciples on the... Um, uh, on the uh, Mount of Olives before his ascension when he gives them the command to go out and spread the gospel to all the world. Now this is very important because in the beginning Jesus said his spirit, uh, God said, my spirit will not remain with you for a while because in the flesh you have embraced disobedience and you have gone away from God. But God turned all of this around for a period of time for man to learn, to want, to desire, to thirst after the presence of God in his life. And we, if we look at all the ancient civilizations, um, Babylonians, the Greek civilization, the Egyptian, uh, even societies which didn't rise up to great heights of importance in the classical period, 
um, they all had within their systems of society a yearning and a wanting for God. They all knew in the back of their minds that there was something that was missing uh, to fulfill them as human beings. So they created great <clears throat> systems of religion, philosophy, um, knowledge, um, all kinds of concepts that would bring them closer to understanding who they were and what they were. Even in primitive societies that we find uh, even today in the world, in jungle societies in South America, in Indonesia, the primitive people whom we think are uncivilized and have no knowledge have great knowledge because every human being has within him the capacity to know God. And this is where the incarnation becomes um, very important as far as our Christian belief is because the incarnation uh, dramatizes to us and becomes for us the reality of God's love. And that's what incarnation but is. But why is that, Father? Let's, let's explore that. Let's talk about that. You, you talked about some of the other um, religious heri um, heritages and the way people approached God. You know, there are plenty of religious traditions um, hearkening back to ancient times where people were satisfied enough to have that relationship with a God above, a God somewhere else, or even a God that is carved out of stone, for instance, in Babylonian times, if you will. But for us as Christians, there is this distinct relationship with God, which well, the, is based on incarnation and God yes. coming man. Why is that? Well, what there is no satisfaction so? in any religion. There is no satisfaction because death comes and takes everything away. So these religions deal <clears throat> basically with a concept of what is the purpose of our whole being in a world where we exert such great effort and in one instant it's all gone in the face of death. What do we acquire after? So the ancient Egyptians, perplexed by this, and I think all of this is in God's love and plan to bring man, ancient civilizations, to bring the the mind of man eventually to an understanding and a knowledge of the presence of God in his life, to reveal the incarnate word in the proper time, which the scripture says, when the fullness of time had come. All of these civilizations were geared to bring the world into that understanding. And that understanding wasn't going to be the heritage of everybody because that understanding needed a response to. It needed a choice. It needed an open heart. It needed the humility of um, recognizing what we are. We are creatures created and made, as the scripture says, in the image of God. And because of that, we are in need of the presence of God. We need to feel that presence and to know that that presence for us is complete and total fulfillment. And how are we going to know that? Are we going to know it by a philosophical system? Are we going to know it by religious rites? Are we going to know it by burial rites? Are we going to know it by hope in a future life of bearing food and relatives and others with us? Hopefully somehow uh, we're going to enjoy a better life. Well, the aspect is that man tried in all of his um, limit, limitations to understand what is the purpose, why is he here, and for what direction is he to take in life itself. And that purpose and direction uh, basically is shown to us when Jesus is born, his incarnation. Now, here's the, the mystery that unfolds, and it's recorded in the hymns of the church, especially around the Easter time. It's also recorded around, I mean, uh, Christmas time, but it's also recorded around Easter. It's recorded around the time of the Annunciation. All of these hymns reflect the incarnation, uh, Jesus becoming flesh, because the incarnation is the beginning of salvation. And what is salvation? Salvation is knowledge of God. Salvation is understanding and experiencing in faith 
the reality and the presence of God. And this isn't given by just our effort. It is given by God's grace. The great saints of the church who went through many trials and tribulations understood this because the grace of God enlightened them uh, during their journey of faith. So it means that we have to relinquish something. And what do we have to relinquish? We have to relinquish uh, um, the idea that we're something so great that we have all the answers. And we don't have all the answers. So in the fullness of time, Jesus is born. Now, who's Jesus? And what is this birth? And how are we to understand it? Well, number one, we have to understand the limitations of our cardinal mind that this birth is a mystery, but nevertheless is revealed to us that we can understand it in faith. That God, who has everything, controls everything, not in the sense of a ruler or emperor that we have to shudder before, but in the sense of a loving parent. When you gave birth or when your wife uh, gave birth to children and you have your children in the house, your children understand one thing, that you are the father and, the, and your wife is the mother. They understand in their infancy a relationship. They don't get it completely, but they feel the warmth, the love, the protection, um, the food, you know, all of these things that somehow bring some comfort to their life and they realize now, they start to realize about themselves. Thank you, Father. We'll come back in the next segment and talk a little bit more about the Incarnation. But right now, let's go to Quailin, where when we talk about Christ being amongst us, we need to be a part of the body of Christ too and be active in our congregations. Quailin and her guests are going to talk more about that in a moment. Do the Orthodox believe in purgatory? No, but the Orthodox pray for the departed that they may rest in the place of light and peace appointed for them until the final judgment at the end of time. The best image is of Lazarus in Abraham's bosom in Luke 16, verse 22. You know, I'm Quayla Nassar, and when we're talking about Christ wanting us to be like Him, it's also talking about how we can serve the church. And my guest today is Alexis Kajaropoulos Cross. You are the president of par your parish council. Correct. And, you know, what do you do to inspire others to become involved? Uh, th three things, really, Quayla. First, being involved myself. Secondly, uh, recognizing and encouraging those who are already involved and making sure I thank them. And thirdly, and most importantly, asking people to become involved. So you're a role model first. What do you do to demonstrate that you're a role model for the rest of the parish? Do you expect your other parish council members to do the same? Certainly, parish council members are um, the lay leadership and uh, their role models as lay leadership for the rest of the parishioners. So I would expect and uh, we have a wonderful parish council that is very highly involved. So parish council normally is involved in things like the administrative area, but do you see that role as being broader than that? Uh, certainly in welcoming guests, in rolling up sleeves to uh, clean up the kitchen or do um, a mailing, uh, whatever the, the need is at the time. What do you do to thank people who are already involved? Uh, take them aside, say that thank you quietly, but there are also times that it's appropriate to thank people in front of other people, for example, at parish council meetings. But the hardest is probably getting those people who aren't involved, involved. Uh, th there are some people that tell you no, but you can't be put off, mm -hmm. and sometimes it's the wrong time, so you have to be persistent and, and keep asking. So whose responsibility do you think it is? Do you think it's just the chair of parish council? Whose responsibility is it to get people involved? Really, it's everyone's. But again, I would look to parish council as the lay leadership, as leaders to, to get people involved. You know, and sometimes people are just so busy that they really can't become involved um, on a, you know, they, they say, oh my God, I can't commit to being there every month. Well, certainly you don't want to badger anyone because that would be a real turnoff um, and defeat the purpose of getting them involved. 
but by listening and getting to know people, finding out what their interests are, what, what they enjoy, and really what their gifts, their God-given gifts and abilities are, to, um, to see where you can harness them in the church. And, you know, you talk about someone's God-given gifts and some people who are involved in, you know, they say, okay, this is what I do for a living. And t sometimes when you volunteer, you end up doing that same kind of thing just because that's your area of expertise. W what do you do with someone who says, I don't, I want to do something that's different? Can you help them find those kinds of, uh, of opportunities? You know, say for, well, you're an attorney, for example. Okay, so you wouldn't want to necessarily always look at the contracts. What other kinds of things could you do? Uh, well, for example, I, m my involvement was first with assisting the teen Soyo, and then I moved into the choir, and I'm still a member of the mm -hmm. choir, but I've moved out of teen Soyo and currently serving on parish council. So actually there's great freedom to try on a lot of different hats in the church. What would you say, you know, you're, you see that role that you've been doing, what would you say is your greatest success story? Uh, there's one individual that I'm thinking of that um, I had approached about two or three years ago about serving on parish council, and uh, the individual was overextended at the time and um, said no. Uh, later became involved on an ad hoc basis this past year and is now currently considering coming on parish council um, in this upcoming year. And why do you think it's important for people to be involved in church? What has inspired you? What, what have you gotten out of it? Uh, it's, a, it's a concrete way, a tangible way of showing my love and um, my love for God. It's a way to, to serve Him concretely. Do you feel like that's brought you closer? Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks so much for being with us. My pleasure. Welcome back. We're with Father Polycarp Romaeus, and we're talking about the Incarnation, or in other words, God becoming man. Father, when we left earlier the segment, we were talking about the hymns of the church and how the hymns of the church, we have these beautiful hymns that talk to us about the Incarnation and its importance. Tell me more. Let's talk a little bit about hymnology. Well, the hymns of the church express the Incarnation in very vivid terms as parenthood. Uh, the love of a parent for its child, and that's what God personifies in the Incarnation. He left uh, what he was, emptied himself, not losing his, who he is, God. And he came and dwelt among men so that man could know him in a very real and tangible and personal way. Just as the child, as we had mentioned before, knows its parent. And God expressed this love for him so much that he restored what man was and received from God. The ability to choose God. The ability to know God as Adam and Eve in the garden knew God. So this is a reversal, if you will, of the sin of Adam and Eve. Absolutely. He becomes the new Adam and we become his children and we're led in by the new parent, Christ, the incarnate, God, who becomes for us very personal, very real. In the Old Testament, God was understood through the law of the Hebrew nation. God was understood through the philosophies and the aspirations of the classical societies, which were all geared to bringing us to a knowledge of God. But in the New Testament, God now is known as a parent, as love, as personal, as real. And he doesn't call us subjects. He doesn't call us slaves. He calls us now friends. We have a relationship which is intimate, like friends have, like family have. And this allows us to grow and to produce and, uh, and uh, progress in a very, in our human essence. Of so, what we are. So when Jesus Christ, God, becomes man, what we have is really the restoration of the relationship we used to have with God. If you go prior to Adam and Eve's sin, um, didn't we have a much more intimate relationship with God? It was intimate. It was intimate because in the Old Testament, God walked in the garden and spoke with man. It was intimate because God knew man in a personal way. And now God is with us again but in the flesh. So we see that not only is he God, but now he is the God-man in Jesus Christ. We can touch him, 
We can hear Him. We can smell Him. We can sit with Him. We can eat with Him. And this is the amazing mystery that's unfolded, that God is truly love and loves His creation. It's not only for man that He became incarnate, but He saves His whole creation. The whole world, everything that he created, because when man fell from disobedience with God, all of nature fell too. And now everything is restored. But Father, when you talk about our relationship with God, as I'm listening to you, you talk in the present tense. You talk about us with God now, not a Jesus who walked some time ago. No, no. God is present now. He's Emmanuel. God is with us now. And we know that God is with us now. And we participate in that knowledge through the life of the church. Because in the life of the church, our participation in a personal sense with God is not only through the sacraments, but the most important thing that man can render back to God is to worship God. And that's what man wants to do. He wants to worship God. He wants to feel that he's always in the presence of God. And this brings him great joy. I mean, look at the fact that people go to church. Our services are not short services, but yet they're services that envelop all the senses of uh, our nature. And it brings it before God that we can communicate and be in His presence. And for that hour or two hours, we are not the same individuals. We stand in the presence of God. And the time goes by and we don't even feel tired. Of course, we feel tired maybe sometimes. But this is a good tiredness. The important thing for man in his relationship with God is to worship him in truth and in correct practice. And this is what orthodoxy brings us. This is the message that orthodoxy, I think, can give to a modern world that somehow feels that God is, where is he? And especially now, even with the coming of Christmas and all the religious holidays in the Christian church that come, we sort of uh, become um, sidetracked with the secular. But the secular sure. is nothing compared to when we go to the church and we worship God because that is the whole essence of uh, the incarnation, that we have a bond, we have a close relationship with God. And we can sense it and we can feel it through our physical aspect of our bodies and our soul and our mind and heart. And then this is translated to our neighbor, because when we know God, we know love. And if we have love, we want to love our neighbor. And we want the world restored in the image of God. Father, let's use another one of the great tools of orthodoxy, the gift God has given us in iconography, to talk a little bit more about the incarnation. Which and I, it was a great segue for, in terms of love, because the icon itself exudes love. Yes. And um, why don't we, let's bring this up here, and you can um, talk a little bit about, the, this is the icon, obviously, the nativity of Christ. But what does it tell us about the incarnation of Christ? Well, first of all, the, the, the art itself is Byzantine, so it's abstract. And it shows the abstractness of the mountains and the sky and the light and so forth. And all of this is done in this way to show that creation is new. And here we have the Christ in the manger, in a cave, because it's not... Um, it's not uh, we don't have a little wooden shed here. No, it wasn't. It was a cave in the scriptures. And there's a hymn in the church that says, what, what do we give at the incarnation of Christ? The earth gave a cave, nature gave its manger, um, the, the heavens gave the stars, um, the, the animals came forth and gave the warm breath to the Christ, the ox and the donkey. And who did we have to give to Christ? What could we give to Christ? We gave the Virgin Mary, the Mother of God, because she willfully accepted to receive um, the good news to give birth to Christ. So here we have in the icon Christ wrapped in the swaddling clothes, which uh, portrays to us the whole life of Christ which he is a sacrifice because he's wrapped in uh, the burial shroud at the crucifixion. He came here to the world to restore man and to take the most terrible, frightening thing away from us, and that was death. And of course, the cave represents the tomb, the manger represents the, um, the grave, the swaddling clothes, the burial clothing, 
and of course the mother of God here shown in this nativity icon is in a relaxed position because the birth that she gave was not the same birth of natural childbirth with pain. That was the birth of Eve, the fallen Eve, but this is the restored Eve, the new Eve, who gives birth painlessly and does not lose her virginity, does not lose her purity. These are things that are hard to explain and understand, but nevertheless they're experienced in the worship of the church. And here she's in a reclining position to demonstrate and to emphasize to us in a very real way that there was a painless birth. But nevertheless, Christ was really flesh. He's God and man. And to demonstrate that, we go into the corner of the icon and we see that the body of Jesus needed to be washed and to be wrapped and taken care of because he truly was flesh. So what in essence this icon teaches us is that God is incarnate and in that incarnation already at Christmas we are taught about Easter the, that he comes to die for yes, us. Yes, yes. Okay. And that he participates fully in our in weak our nation, nature. Weakness. He participates. He allows himself, the omnipotent God who created the Virgin Mary, who created all of this, he allows himself to lay in a dark cave. He allows God himself, who he is, allows himself to be touched, nourished, and, uh, and uh, held by the Virgin Mary, by others to wash him. He allows nature to be so awestruck by the incarnation that it gives the star, which is an amazing thing because in the hymns of the church, the star is not a natural star, a star that was created by God and appeared in the heavens, but it is the uncreated light that the wise men saw. Okay. Father, I think that what you've told us is iconography teaches us a great deal about this and it gives us a real sense of what the incarnation means for us. And I thank you for being with us today and sharing all of this. Thank you. All right. Thank you. You know, the incarnation, it has a great influence in our lives. And John, you know, what did we learn today? I think we learned that the incarnation, God becoming man, really restored the intimate relationship that we had with God the relationship we had as Adam and Eve before sin. And if you'd like to know a little bit more about the Orthodox faith, be sure to tune in to Orthodoxy Now on the radio at WEDO 810 on your radio AM dial on Sundays at 930. And be sure to watch Orthodoxy Now on television on uh, the Christian Associates Channel 95 and on Comcast On Demand. And be sure if you'd like to know a few more uh, bits of information or you have a topic that you want to uh, have us bring to you here on Orthodoxy Now, be sure to send it to the address on our screen or check out our website at orthodoxynowtv.com. Thank you for joining us.